Thus far, we've discussed uh, filter performance uh, strictly in terms of power, the available power of the source, uh, one side of the filter, and the power absorbed by the match load at the other side of the filter. The ratio of those two powers, of course, we call a power transmission coefficient. Now let's go through and um, uh, look at not the power at the input and out of our filter, but the voltage, the complex voltage. Again, we're doing timer harmonic analysis here, so we express our voltages at the input and output as complex functions of omega. Complex values that have both a magnitude and relative, relative phase. Now, I should be explicit here. When I say V in and V out, I'm talking about the total voltage here at the input port and the total voltage at the output port. Uh, because we have uh, a matched load here, the transmission line, that total voltage then would simply be the voltage of the wave propagating toward the match load, the wave incident on the match load, and since there is no reflected wave. On the input, however, the total voltage can consist of both of the incident wave toward the filter, which of course would have a power equal to the available power of our match source, and likewise um, uh, a voltage, a wave that is propagating away from our filter. We can assume that in the passband that reflected wave is very small and so that the total voltage here Vn will consist only of the wave, the voltage of the wave that's propagating toward the input. Either way, we can go through and take the ratio of these two complex values, and that gives us our uh, filter phase function, our filter uh, transfer function, I should say, and I'll call this value h. This is a complex function of frequency. Since we're taking the ratio of two complex voltages, we get a complex value. Now, in microwave engineering, typically what we would do is write this as a scattering parameter called S21. We haven't talked about scattering parameters in ECS 622, so I'm going to uh, uh, leave it in a more generic complex value we'll call H uh, for the uh, transfer function. Again, the important thing here is this is a complex relationship as opposed to the relationship for power transfer coefficient, which is the ratio of real valued powers. This is the ratio of complex voltages. Now, of course, we can take the magnitude of either side of this equation, and therefore we're taking the magnitude of this complex uh, value H and the magnitude of both the uh, complex value V out and V in. And from that, we can come up with this result. And this really tells us how the magnitudes of the voltage, both on the input and output, are related. They're simply related by the magnitude of this transfer function, h. And of course, the magnitude of the input voltage and the magnitude of the output voltage have a very physical meaning. The magnitude of these complex voltages tell us the magnitude of the sinusoid at the input. At frequency omega, how big is the oscillation? A lot of highfalutin mathematics, complex numbers, simply to tell us how big this is. If we're in the passband, if the frequency of the sinusoid omega is in the passband, what we'll find ideally is the magnitude of the oscillation on the output is equal to the magnitude of the oscillation and in the input. In other words, the magnitude of h would be approximately 1. In the stop band, the magnitude of the oscillation on the output would be zero. We don't want any power absorbed by our match load if it's in the stop band. Therefore, we want the output voltage to be equal to zero. And of course, that could only happen when the magnitude of this uh, complex transfer function, h, is equal to zero at that frequency. So this is the relationship for magnitude. If we took the magnitude squared of h, we would find that that is effectively equal to the power transmission coefficient t that we talked about earlier, since the magnitude squared of the voltages is proportional to the power. What else, though, can we do with this complex transfer function h? In addition to de re uh, determining the relationship between the magnitudes of the input and output sinusoid of a filter, we can use it to determine the relative phase of those sinusoidal oscillations. In this notation, um, uh, the argument of this complex number means the phase of this uh, complex number. Remember, every complex value has a magnitude in a phase. Uh, 
And uh, we can, from the previous expression, from our definition of our complex transfer function of our filter, we can uh, determine the relationship between the relative phase at the output sinusoid and the relative phase at the input. And that relationship is determined by the uh, phase of this complex transfer function. Basically, the phase of the complex transfer function H tells us the phase shift, we can say, between the input and the output. If this value is uh, pi over 2, 90 degrees, we would see that the input and output oscillations would be 90 degrees out of phase. It would be oscillating sort of something like this, all right? Let's see if I can make sure I'm in the, in the picture. Let me move back. 90 degrees out of phase, oscillating. If uh, this was pi, they'd be 180 degrees out of phase, so they'd be oscillating something like this. Of course, if this were 2 pi, they'd be back in phase, and they'd be oscillating together. So, the um, again, the phase of the complex transfer function will tell us the phase difference between the input and the output. Now, you might argue that who cares what the phase difference is? Who cares what the phase shift is when it comes to a filter? A filter's job is to go through and reject the, sign, the signals that are uh, uh, in, the, in the stop band, rather, and to allow those signals with frequencies, those sinusoids with frequencies, uh, the proper frequencies within the pass band to propagate through the filter and ultimately be absorbed by the load. Do we care that the phase is shifted in the process? What difference would it make? Well, it turns out the phase response is, in fact, very important in a bandpass filter. And this is uh, a fact that is, uh, uh, I don't think, well appreciated by uh, 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 many electrical engineers. Uh, it's sort of a rookie mistake that phase doesn't matter when it comes to a bandpass filter. But the phase response, it turns out, matters uh, very greatly. And if we're not careful, um, we can specify a filter uh, whose phase response is so poor that it will make the filter worthless to us. So let's see if we can figure out why. So um, just to be clear on what our uh, phase is of our complex transfer function H, um, uh, like any complex number or any complex function, we can write it in terms of a real part and imaginary part. The real plus j times the imaginary part is this complex uh, value h. Um, but more importantly for filter, we really don't care about the real part or the imaginary part of h. We write it the complex value in this way. It's more useful to us uh, to write it such that we uh, can express it in terms of its magnitude and then e the j phi, where this is the phase of that uh, complex transfer function. And again, this is not a notation. This is an exact mathematical uh, expression. And this equal sign is not equivalent to. It literally means equal to. If we uh, uh, used Euler's equation, we could show that, uh, that this, in fact, is equal to this here. The value of this phase we could write in terms of the real and imaginary part if we take the ratio and take the inverse tangent, carefully take the inverse tangent, we can go through and um, this is a full 2 pi inverse tangent, so uh, um, carefully take it there to find the phase here. We don't really ever do this, but I just put this in there for completeness. Again, this phase response is something that we care very much about. As we talked about earlier, this uh, uh, phase of the complex transfer function of a filter uh, expresses, tells us the phase shift between the input oscillation and the output oscillation at some frequency omega. The important question though is what causes this phase shift? And we can attribute this phase shift to propagation delay. It takes a finite amount of time for the electromagnetic wave to propagate from the input of the filter to the output of the filter. That delay, that time it takes to propagate through, will actually result in what appears to be a phase shift between the input and output. And this is very important, this idea of a propagation delay. Uh, it takes time to get from the input to the output is key to understanding filter behavior and uh, uh, moreover what uh, kind of filter behavior that we would deem to be um, problematic with respect to filter use. So you might ask, can we determine the propagation delay through the filter? How long does it take for a uh, signal to propagate from the input of a filter to the out to the output? Can we determine from this complex transfer function? And the answer is we can, but it's not particularly simple. 
to determine the delay from this uh, complex transfer function. Um, it uh, takes a little bit of mathematical manipulation to determine it, um, to understand what that mathematical uh, manipulation is and why uh, we do it, uh, we're going to go through and spend uh, the remainder of this presentation talking about just that. So we're on page 5 and we're going to go to 19. So uh, uh, the, the answer will uh, be coming, but it'll take a little bit to get there. Because the first thing we're going to do is start with a, an example, a two-port network with an impulse response, which is the direct delta function. Um, um, Basically, this uh, delta function is just a, uh, a function that is defined, uh, well, the direct delta function is a function that is uh, uh, at zero at all times except for t is equal to zero, and the integral of that function is equal to one. In this case, the impulse response is a delayed version of that direct delta function, delayed by a value tau. Tau is some some number. Um, and so this is shifted in time. So instead of getting uh, this delta function right at time t is equal to zero, the delta function is delayed some amount uh, by uh, value time, tau. So this is just sort of a hypothetical two-port network with this impulse response. And so how to relate the input signal to an output signal uh, uh, for a um, uh, network with this impulse response. And of course we do that using convolution. So let's say we want to find the output, some arbitrary output voltage with respect to time. So notice here we're now no longer doing um, a time harmonic analysis. We're not assuming any kind of a sinusoidal signal. This is some arbitrary function um, uh, of V out with respect to time. And that function can be determined if we know the input signal into our two-port device. Um, our two-port network with this impulse response, and we convolve that arbitrary input signal. Again, this is not complex. This is a real valued voltage Vn with respect to time. We convolve that with our impulse response, and that would give us our, our output voltage. Now, of course, the uh, convolution might make you a little bit nervous uh, being able to form that, but it turns out, of course, uh, because it's a direct delta function we put in here, we're going through and evaluating an integral with the direct delta function in it. And I once had a professor who said uh, integrating with the direct delta function was joy itself. And uh, I think he literally meant that and made him very happy. Certainly it's much easier to do the uh, uh, integration with the direct delta function. All we have to do is evaluate this at the time where this is equal to zero. And when we do that, uh, we find that this argument is equal to zero when t prime is, uh, or t rather, is equal to t prime minus tau. And so this becomes now our uh, input, uh, um, actually that should be out, oh, oh I'm sorry, the output voltage is the input voltage delayed by some tau. So it's pretty simple. If we put in a signal Vn like this into a two-port device with this impulse response, it simply delays the input signal by exactly a value tau. And we get the same output signal out as we put in, only delayed by, again, this value tau. All right, so what does this have to do with phase shifts? So what would the um, what would this um, uh, example two-port network, the one with the impulse response, which is simply a, uh, delta function delayed by value tau, what would that do to a sinusoid? What would be the magnitude and relative phase uh, between an input sinusoid and an output sinusoid? To determine this, we can go through and determine the complex transfer function of such a two-board device. And of course, we can do that by taking the Fourier transform of the impulse response. Again, normally this would make us a little nervous trying to find the Fourier transform of some arbitrary uh, impulse function. But in our case, the impulse function is very simple. It's just a time-shifted delta function here. And so we multiply that by either j omega t. Once again, we're integrating by the delta function, joy itself. Uh, evaluate at um, uh, t when this is equal to zero. And that is equal to zero when t is equal to tau. And so this is the result. Our complex transfer function of this uh, example two-port device that we just uh, talked about on the previous page, that transfer function is e to the minus j omega tau. Notice this is a complex function of omega, as h should be. Notice there's no time in here. Tau is the delay uh, through that uh, two-port device.
If we look at the magnitude of this complex transfer function, of course the magnitude of a complex exponential is one, and so the magnitude is equal to one. From a sine wave, sinusoidal time harmonic analysis, um, the uh, sinusoid at the output of this two-port device would be precisely the same as the magnitude at the input. The difference would be there would be a phase shift there, and that phase shift between input and output would be equal to minus omega tau. Notice that phase shift between input and output depends on tau, the delay uh, through that, um, uh, through that two-port device, but it also depends on omega, the frequency of oscillation of our sinusoid. So this is the phase shift we get between input and output for, again, this example two-port device, the one which is just basically delays the input signal by a value tau. All right, let's do that another way and try to put these two pieces together. Um, in this case, we're simply going to write the input signal as a sinusoid, not a complex representation of the sinusoid. We're just literally going to say cosine omega t, uh, a real valued voltage with respect to time. It's like we took the real part of u the, uh, minus j omega t. Uh, that would give us cosine omega t. All right, let's say this was our input signal into our um, example two-port device, the one that delays our signal by a value of tau. Well, we know what the result's going to be there. Uh, it's simply going to be a delayed version of this. So we replace t with t minus tau, which delays this signal by a value of tau. Notice we can multiply through the omega here. So then we get cosine of omega t minus omega tau. And from this, it's clear the um, difference between the relative phase of the input and the relative phase of the output. The only difference there, you can say the relative phase here is zero on the input. The relative phase on the output is a minus omega tau. Of course, omega, minus omega tau is exactly the phase that we predicted when we do, did our uh, 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 time harmonic analysis using complex voltages. And so we can either view the signal, uh, a, a sinusoidal signal at the input, as being delayed by amount of tau seconds, and that would be the mathematics that we have here, or we can view it as being phase shifted by an amount uh, minus omega tau, which is what we uh, did on the previous page. Either way, we come up with the exact same mathematical representation, so we could, um, uh, again, view it uh, in either of these two ways. However, as I said before, this really is the physical reason for the phase shift. The fact that uh, it, it does take a while for a signal to propagate through. I say a while, it's in, you know, in human terms, it's instantaneous, but, uh, uh, you know, we're talking uh, nanoseconds or so uh, for a filter for the signal to get from one side to the other. So we go back to our original problem though, and that question was how do we determine the value of tau? For this, again, example, this uh, hypothetical two-port device which delays all signals by a value of uh, uh, time value of tau, um, how, if, how would we determine what that value of tau is if we didn't know a priori? Is there a measurement we could do to determine the value of tau? Now you might say, well, we could do a uh, phase measurement. We could look at the phase of an input sinusoid and an output sinusoid and look at that phase difference. And from that phase difference, we could calculate the value of tau. And that's based on the fact that we could say that the phase shift, as we determined in the uh, previous slide, is equal to minus omega tau. We can rearrange that to solve for tau. I just measure the phase difference between input and output, and then divide it by the frequency of the oscillation, I multiply by minus one, and there you have it. That's our delay. That seems like that would work. But the problem really becomes here with the measuring the phase shift between input and output. We're used to in labs, and you've probably done this, gone through and look at the input and output of a sinusoid through some uh, linear uh, time invariant circuit there. We measure the phase shift and it would be, you know, uh, 120 degrees or, um, you know, um, 45 degrees, some value. The reality, though, is the phase shift um, that we're really measuring is very much larger than that, almost certainly. Um, the reason that we have something that's relatively small we come up with is the modulo 2 pi that we use to measure phase. 
because we measure a phase uh, difference between the input and output, and let's say it's 90 degrees, well, let's say, let's say it's pi over 2. Um, it could be pi over 2, but it could be also pi over 2 plus 2 pi, or pi over 2 minus 4 pi. We have a problem where we can't really say exactly what the phase is. We because again, there's no uh, there's the ambiguity between uh, zero phase shift and uh, phase shift of two pi or four pi or six pi or eight pi. Uh, because of that, we don't really know what this value here is. And if we divide it by omega, who knows what this is? So again, more specifically, the uh, sinusoid. Um, we write it in this form, but from a measurement standpoint, really it's this plus any integer value of 2 pi. And these integers could be positive or negative. And so we really can't tell which of the output signals we are, uh, uh, we are looking. What is the value of n? Typically, of course, in all these measurements, we'll plot it on a 2 pi modulo system. We'll either go through and talk about a phase shift uh, between minus pi and pi or between 0 and 2 pi, where the reality is the actual phase shift is nowhere near these interpretations. The phase shift usually is, is much, much uh, larger than um, uh, a value of, uh, of, of minus 2 pi, for example. So to see that, let's plot the um, uh, phase value, which is minus omega tau. So this is phase. This is the phase shift, the phase of h, the phase difference between input and output. And we calculate it to be for this example, again, this is for this example two-port device that delays the signal by a value tau. We calculate that phase shift to be equal to minus omega tau. So we're going to plot that phase as a function of omega. And notice this is simply an equation of a line. The y-intercept is zero. The slope is equal to minus tau. All right. So the slope is equal to minus tau as we go down this. This is what we calculated the phase should be. But notice we don't have to get very high in frequency before that phase shift uh, becomes uh, a value that is greater than minus 2 pi, greater than minus 4 pi, greater than minus 8 pi. As this keeps, uh, the frequency increases, the value of that phase shift then becomes more and more and more negative, way outside <clears throat> of our 2 pi modulo representation. If we actually measured the phase shift between the input and the output at some frequency on our bench, we wouldn't see if, couldn't read a phase shift of minus seven pi, for example. Again, that doesn't fit into our two pi modulo. Instead, what we would get um, is a value, well, it would be right there on the border. Let's see, let me make a different one. Let's say minus six pi. It would actually give us a value of zero it appeared that the input and output were exactly in phase at that frequency. The reality is they were shifted by exactly 6 pi, an integer multiple of uh, 2 pi, and that's why we can't tell the difference. And so this is going to be a problem here. If we do our calculation, we look at the uh, phase shift at this frequency and we say, oh, the phase shift's zero. Well, if the phase shift's zero, that means the delay must be zero. The signal's coming out of the output at the same way, looking the same way as it went into the input. And of course, that's not the case. We have a delay. Uh, it's, it's delayed more than zero. It's delayed by whatever value of tau will give us a phase shift of 6 pi or minus 6 pi at this frequency. But again, we can't reveal that. We can't determine that from our measurement. We can't tell the difference between um, a zero phase shift and a phase shift of minus 2 pi or four, minus 4 pi or minus 6 pi. So it turns out this equation does not work. All right, I put big x's here. Do not use this result. Um, Oftentimes I have students that uh, uh, I think are just looking through the notes for some equation to use and they stumble on this and say, well, it's written down on the page, it must work. No, this does not work. Uh, again, we can hopefully see the answer, the reason why, um, you know, this phase that we might measure, if it's zero, we would say it's a, a delay that is uh, zero. Worse yet, if that phase shift that we measure uh, is positive, and of course that can happen in our two pi modules, we get a phase shift that's positive, we would find the delay is negative, which physically would mean that the output, uh, the signal uh, exits the output before it actually reaches the input. Uh, so that would be uh, non-causal uh, in, in that case. So how, can we determine delay? Clearly we can't 
simply measure the phase shift of a sinusoid at some frequency omega, input to output, take that difference in phase, divide by omega, multiply by bias 1, and get a value of tau. We'll get a number all right, but it won't be the actual delay. So how do we find tau? It turns out we can find tau. We just need to do a different mathematical operation than what is described here. So let's go back and look at our plot. Uh, again, this is the, uh, the phase shift, the phase difference between the input and output, uh, the phase argument of our complex transfer function h as a function of omega. This is what, for this uh, example device, this is what that phase shift actually is, as a function of frequency. It depends on delay through the device and on the frequency of the sinusoid itself. But this blue is what we actually measured. And this blue measurement and this red truth is, uh, seems to be a, a completely different as they possibly could be. Our measurement, again, is constrained by the 2 pi modulo. As our phase goes to minus pi, we jump up to pi and start all over again. Again, this transition is not physical. It's just a uh, manifestation of our modulo 2 pi measurement that we have. Some of these values for our phase shift is positive and some are negative, where for the red line, um, they're all negative. Again, we have something that's constrained between minus pi and pi, where the red um, uh, function that we plot uh, continually has become continually more and more negative as frequency increases. So there doesn't seem to be any th similarity between these two uh, functions. Or is there? Look closely at these two functions that we're plotting, the blue and the red. There is a characteristic that they have in common. The characteristic they have in common, of course, is the slope. Basically, this is a piecewise um, function where the, um, even though it's discontinuous at this um, uh, modulo 2 pi, notice the slope at every point is the same. Likewise, since this is an equation of a line, the slope at every point is the same. In fact, if you look at the slope of this blue function and the slope of this red function, you'll find that not only are they same at every point along each of the two functions, the slopes are the same for each of them. All right, if I were to extend this down, it would be parallel to that red line. If I extend this down, it'd be parallel to the red line. The slope everywhere for both the blue and the red function are the same. Here's where it gets better. That slope, we know, is equal to minus tau. We can look at this red function and figure out the slope. This is an equation of a line. Remember omega here. Omega is essentially x. Phase is y. m is minus tau. That is the slope of our line. That's exactly the same as the slope of the blue. And so if we were to go and measure the phase as a function of frequency, we would get this blue function. And from that blue function, we could determine the slope. And from that slope, we know is equal to minus tau. We take the slope of this function and multiply it by minus 1, and that would give us delay through that filter. Now, how do we mathematically determine the slope of some function? How do we determine the slope of a function? Well, of course, we determine the slope of a function by taking the first derivative. Clearly, in our red function, omega minus omega tau, if we took the derivative with respect to omega, we get minus tau. That is the slope. We determine it by taking the first derivative. So, if we know not just the value of the phase shift at one value omega, but instead know the value of the phase shift at all frequencies omega, then we can take the derivative with respect to omega, multiply by minus 1, and that gives the propagation delay through this example two-board device that we've talked about. How do we determine the phase shift between input to output? If we're talking about very high frequencies, microwave frequencies, um, it's, it's difficult. We can't simply uh, take our oscilloscope and two scope probes on the input and output. Microwave filters, it's much diff more difficult. Fortunately, we have test equipment that allow us to do that. This is a picture of a uh, network analyzer, what we call a network analyzer, and it measures, um, among other things, it will measure the phase difference, uh, the phase shift between a uh, one side of a two-port network and the other. For example, one side of a filter and the other.
So this is um, a plot of a network analyzer it's a, that does a filter analysis. And basically what it does is measure this complex transfer function H. Now, in reality, it's measuring the scattering primer S21, but uh, the two are eff uh, effectively equivalent. Um, uh, the lighter kind of uh, a white plot here that we see is the transmission function of the filter. And it's pretty easy to see that this is a bandpass filter. This is frequency, the horizontal axis is frequency. All right, so we're looking at the power transmission function as a uh, uh, function of frequency as we move along. From here to here, right here to right here frequency wise is the band pass of the filter. As we get out of the pass band of the filter, then we have a roll off into the stop band. And notice it's not a perfect transition. It takes, uh, um, uh, it can't be instantaneous. So uh, we roll off as a function of frequency. Notice it gets flat down here. This is actually noise. The signal has dropped down on the noise and it's so low it cannot be uh, uh, measured further at this point. So from here to here, we get a very nice plot of our power transmission function, showing clearly where the passband of our bandpass filter is. What about this orange plot? This orange plot is the phase then of S21, the phase shift between input and output as a function now of frequency. And if we look closely, it's kind of hard to see here, but we get that sort of sawtooth plot that we showed, the blue plot uh, that was shown earlier. And this again is simply a 2 pi modulus mapping of the phase shift. We go down here at the bottom and that would correspond to minus pi and up here at the top would correspond to uh, plus pi radians. And so the uh, phase shift becomes more and more negative. We're dropping until it gets down to minus pi and then we jump up to plus pi and we start all over again. Notice, however, there's a slight difference between the blue plot that we had um, that I showed, um, uh, the sawtooth plot uh, for our uh, example two-port device and the uh, phase for this filter. As we get closer to the uh, half power points, the bandwidth edges, what we see is now the slope of this phase starts to change. We get some distortion. We don't see that sawtooth anymore. The slope here becomes uh, uh, decidedly different. You can see it even more clearly on this side here where the slope is changing. And so that's a problem. The slope it one frequency for this filter, the slope of the phase function, is different than the slope at a different frequency. So how do we make sense of that? What is the propagation delay through this filter uh, uh, in this case? In our example, our two-port device, was the, which was the example, which was a, a device that simply shifts the input signal by a specific delay tau, a number, um, um, then that phase shift uh, as a function of frequency was minus omega tau, which is what we would measure on a network analyzer if we were measuring this hypothetical uh, device. But of course, this hypothetical device does not exist. What we find is that the actual phase response with respect to frequency would not be equal to minus omega tau uh, exactly. Uh, what we find is the impulse response, therefore, is not this simple form. More generally, we find that the um, derivative of the phase that we get is not a number. The derivative of the phase is itself a function of omega. So again, our phase function with respect to frequency uh, is not going to be equal to minus omega tau for filters. Um, and so we can't go through and say the delay of this filter is exactly, you know, 23.4 nanoseconds. Uh, instead, what we find is that the delay through a filter is not a constant. The delay through the filter is dependent itself on the frequency of the signal different values of frequency, different omega will propagate at different speeds and therefore have different propagation delays than sinusoids at other frequencies omega. And this is a very important point.
all the signals that will pass through the filter, all the frequencies that lie in the uh, uh, bandwidth of that filter, the pass band of the filter, all of those sinusoids will pass through, but they'll pass through at slightly different velocities. They'll pass through being delayed by slightly different values. Now, to determine this function, the delay is a function of frequency, uh, we still uh, do the same operation as we did in our example problem, which is to take the uh, first derivative of the phase with respect to omega and multiply by minus 1. The only difference between a real filter and our example problem is when we do this, we don't get a number tau. What we get now is a value that changes with frequency. But that value that changes with frequency is the delay. It will give us a delay at any given frequency. We would have to take this function that results and evaluate it at whatever frequency we we're interested in to determine precisely the delay associated with that particular frequency. And again, different frequencies will have different uh, delays because different frequencies will propagate at different speeds through the filter from the input to the output. This function that we get is known as phase delay, and it's a very important function to consider when uh, designing specifies and, uh, specifying or using microwave filters. Basically, we have two fundamental functions of frequency when it comes to specifying filter behavior uh, with respect to radio engineering or microwave engineering. The first is our power transmission function. It is capital T. Uh, that's a function of omega. Notice it's a real value, a positive value, uh, between 0 and 1. It relates the power absorbed by the load to the power delivered, or I'm sorry, available from our match source. The second fundamental parameter, though, we have the second fundamental function, I should say, with respect to omega, is this phase delay function. Now, it has, as its variable, it looks like t, but again, that's a Greek letter tau, uh, which is the general variable that's associated with delay, tau, as a function of frequency there. Again, that says how long it takes for a signal at a given frequency to propagate through the filter to one edge to the other. And these really are the two fundamental values. We could argue that the phase uh, as a function of frequency is a, is a, a fundamental um, uh, uh, function uh, for the filter, uh, but really that doesn't tell us much until we take the first derivative and multiply by minus one. In other words, until we convert it into delay. The rookie mistake, of course, as talked about before, is to say I only care about that power transmission function. I only care about the function that tells me uh, about where the pass band is and where the stop band is and what is the roll off, how much roll off do we have between the pass band and the stop band. Uh, but the phase delay is just as important with respect to proper um, um, uh, usefulness of a filter as that um, power uh, uh, ratio or that power coefficient uh, function t. Now why is that? The reason that our phase delay function tau as a function of omega is so important is from that we could determine whether our filter will cause an effect that we call signal dispersion. It turns out our filter can distort signals, modulated signals, radio signals, uh, in a way that make them uh, uh, un unrecognizable after demodulation. Um, it will distort them so we can't extract the information that was sent uh, uh, with them. And uh, whether we are, can successfully do that, whether we have signal dispersion and the, distorts, uh, the distortion that results from that or not, we can determine that from this phase delay, which is why it's so important to specify this. Again, the big rookie mistake, and I saw it happen when I, my, uh, uh, my professional career as a, as a receiver designer, uh, engineers did not pay significant attention to this phase delay function. They designed or specified filters that, uh, in fact, cause signal dispersion for their particular application, and the result was that their received signals could not be demodulated. Uh, the receiver was essentially worthless. So uh, pay attention when you do this delay, and let's talk more about that.